Welcome to Winning Conversations. Dan and I have a treat for you today. We sit down with the one and only Captain Rex Sanders. He is a traveling evangelist that has come to our church and been part of our family since 2015. Him and his family with his wife, LaDonna, minister through Captain Rex's Treasure Adventures, Treasures of the Amazon across the United States and the world at this point. We have a really great conversation really leads into obedience, even in the face of crazy situations. Captain Rex really shows that a faithful man hears from the Lord and obeys at whatever the cost. So we really hope you enjoy this conversation. Let's jump right in. How are you, Brandon? Are you good? I'm good. We're glad you're here. We're so glad you're here. I haven't had my first name used on me in a long time. Do you go by (laughs) Rex primarily? Rex or Cap or Captain... (laughs) <laughs> it, it, but no, Brandon is fine. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Uh, yeah. I had no idea when I saw the name. Like, hey, this is who we're talking to today. I'm like, oh, no Who's idea. That? No idea. Brandon. So, no idea. true story, true story. People here at the ministry thought my parents had three kids. Brandon, Brent, and Rex. They thought. That is hilarious. They, they really did. They thought that they had three kids. They didn't realize Brandon and Rex was the same person. So that's hilarious. Well, now everybody will know. Acting has paid off, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Well, we're really glad you're here, and you have such a legacy with our church family. You've been coming here since 2015, doing uh, the sh- I don't know if you call it a show or what you call it, but you're ministering to our families um, since that time. And now you have a, a camp that we get to go to every year. So, will you just tell us a little bit about how your passion for ministry got started? Tell us kind of the backstory that brings us up. In the Cliff Notes version, of course. It, <laughs> yeah, make it snappy, okay? We don't get all day <laughs> to be hearing your words and I, stuff. Uh, I always knew I was, man, I was knew it was called for ministry. And uh, ever since I was a kid, and I always wanted to go to um, uh, Bible school. Um, but I didn't. My parents uh, also said, no, you need to get a... A real degree, <laughs> and so you can get a real job and make real money. <laughs> but um, so I, um, and also some of y'all have heard the story about how friends are very influential. And because I had a friend who um, I went from sold out, I'm going straight to Rama or ORU or Christ for the Nations to by the time I was a senior, no, I want to go to Texas A&M. Because I'm a cowboy now, you know, right. and um, so I ended up going to a secular school, and my my dad he told me, of course, uh, you know, we can't afford to send you to school, so you gotta um, raise your own money. And I didn't know about grants or loans or anything like that, so I all I knew was scholarships. And the only thing I was good at was uh, acting because I used to act in the church and tell jokes in the church. And even when I sang, I was performing because I did Carmen songs, you know. Nice. (laughs) (laughs) Because you get to perform (laughs) Carmen songs. And so I got a drama scholarship and got my degree in theater. Uh, Started out, though, as med, pre-med. I was going to be a medical because I was really smart and good at math and all that. And uh, my grandmother, before she passed away, a very wealthy woman, she said, do what you love, don't do something for money. And so I changed my major from pre-med to theater. And, uh, of course, most parents would hate that because what's the difference between a theater major and a large pepperoni pizza? Large pepperoni pizza could feed a family of four. Right. <laughs> theater major, <laughs> man, you ain't, you can't, I mean, what kind of job are you going to get? Right. Um, but my parents were always supportive. And uh, so I got my theater degree. Then I went and got another theater degree. And at the same time, I got an education degree because I love teaching. I love, I love teaching. So I graduated from college and um, I didn't have a job. So I was going to move back home um, until I found a job. Mom had a big house, and so, hey, mom cooks great meals, free meals, free rent. Uh, just graduated from college. I mean, I'm 22 years old. I mean, just 22 years old with my my second degree and a double major there, so I actually had three degrees. Wow. Um, and I moved home, and I just knew, though, um, there was nothing for teenagers, and I had a heart for teenagers, I love Jesus, didn't know much about the Bible, but love Jesus and love people. And, and, um, I 
started, I was like, man, um, I want to do a youth church. There was four teenagers um, going to the church at the time. And so I talked my dad into letting me renovate the uh, fellowship hall. And I turned it into like a really cool youth room. I mean, it was first class too. Nice. Um, uh, black lights and block glass stage with, uh, we didn't have LEDs back then, but I, you know, colored lights and I had laser lights and fog machines. <laughs> and I changed it from a youth group to a youth ministry because ministry reaches out. And um, there was a lot of troubled teens in the area. And I, was, I said, that's who I want to minister to. The kids nobody else wants. Um, all these other kids, you know, the other big churches, you know, the first whatever church and this other first fill in the blank church, they had mm -hmm. these big youth groups, but it was for their kids. And you had to fit a certain mold to fit into that right. group. And so um, I started going to the places where the rough kids hanged out. And uh, within three months, three months, we went from four to 150 teenagers. Wow. We got some uh, kids on what? fire, saved on fire, that went to the alternative school. They, we ended up having the whole alternative school come into the youth ministry. Uh, it became such a successful thing that cops, literally cops, they would, a kid get arrested, he would bring him to church and tell the kid, if you'll stay all the way through church, I won't take you to jail. And then they'd say, hey, if he stays all the way, if not, come call us and we're taking him to jail. Because they knew that the kid's life would be changed. Wow. It wasn't just That's a smoke and show, you know, a smoke show and light show. It wasn't just a, it was ministry. And it's not like I was preaching great messages because I didn't <laughs> really know much of the Bible. It wasn't me. It was, it, I was just obedient. I, I had a heart. I love kids and, and teens and kids can right. see through. They could tell when you really care. So that's what started me in the ministry. And being that I had an education degree and a theater degree, because uh, this all was in January. I started this in January of 2000. Wow. Um, and by March of 2000, by March 10th, we had 150 teenagers. Um, That's insane. Yeah. Um, and so I said, hey, I need to be on the mission field. Um, what's the mission field for teenagers? The high school. Mm -hmm. Well, that summer I got a job at the high school um, being a theater arts teacher. And so now here I am in the school with the kids and... Um, you know, it was, it was just amazing. Um, from there, we built a big youth center and basically started a youth church. And, and my dad's church, um, they didn't have money that they gave the youth program. The youth program actually gave the church money because huh. I taught the teens giving and we tithed to the church. So here we were, the youth program giving the big church money. You know, wow. instead nice. of, you know, this is your budget. <laughs> right. I mean, we were creating it. Um, me and my wife always had a thing where we lived on one salary and the other salary went straight into ministry. And so mm -hmm. we were able to fund the ministry, et cetera. And since we were at that point, man, I was wanting to get fired preaching the gospel. I'm in the schools like, like I'm going to get fired. That'd be so cool. I'm in the young 20s. I get <laughs> I mean, fired preaching the gospel. It'd be so cool How, if I got fired. Do you know what? Like, oh, wait, did I hear that right? Like, yeah, man. I'd get great. to go on TV. I got fired preaching the gospel. What have you done? Yeah. You know, that's what I wanted. <laughs> that's so right? great. Uh, I, but I've always been that kind of crazy. All right. And But I had a really great school district and- they wouldn't do they didn't it. Fire darn, you. Darn so, faith, believe in school honest, districts, on, man. Honest to God, true dream. story. The the football players, they would get injured. And instead of, and we're a big 6A school, um, RG3, Robert Griffin III, went to our school. He was one of my theater arts okay. teachers. Yeah. I mean, students. Um, they would get injured. And instead of getting taken to the medical or the trainers or whatever, this is what the kids would say. Take me to Mr. Sanders' classroom. They're like, you got a torn knee or you got this or that. It's like, no, take me to Mr. Sanders' classroom. He'll say that Spanish prayer and I'll be okay. The Spanish prayer? Yeah, that's what they called it, the Spanish prayer. And so they'd that's come, amazing. hey, Sanders, say that Spanish prayer. I'm like, Spanish prayer? What Spanish prayer? You know, well, 
Because I would end my, I'd pray in the Holy Spirit, but then I would end it in nomine patre, fili, spiritus santi, amen. That's just something I like to do. I, I always thought that was, I thought that was neat. In the name of the Father, Son, that's Latin for in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they always thought the whole thing was Spanish. So, and the, but that was their faith. Their faith was if I would say that Spanish prayer, they would be okay. And we would see the kids walk out of wheelchairs. That's um awesome. Every class that I taught, I mean, I would have, supposed to have 25 kids in there. There would be 65 to 70 kids every class in the classroom. And, and um, so that's what got me started in, in ministry. That's, I'm just like, I'm processing this to the 150 kids from three months. That's like astronomical numbers. Like what kind of growth pattern, like the scalability of it. I think about business scaling. I don't know why my brain goes right to like the analytics of it all. Like, right. okay, how do we, we're dealing with four people. Now we're dealing with 150. Now you're in high school and you're obviously teaching them Latin that they haven't quite got it. Well, yet. back to like, that. Um, because I was anticipating 200. I didn't reach my anticipation in that three months. Mm -hmm. I was anticipating and ready for 200. That's where I thought we would be in three months. I've always been a big dreamer. I've always been. So thus forth, I set my goals and, you know, I mean, and I didn't quite reach it in the three months. We did we did reach it within the next, it took 18 months to get the 200 mark uh, consistently. Um, but um, I was prepared for 200 uh, starting out week two. Week one was those four saying, hey, this is my vision. This is ministry. We're going to change and da-da-da-da. This is what we're going to do. Uh, because I, what I did is I took 10% of how many kids went to the high school. There was 2,000 kids in the high school. And I was okay. like, well, man, I can reach 10%. Easy. I mean, well, my goodness, we should be able to get 10% for sure. So that's how I got my number is the 200. And so that was my goal. And I was ready for them. So you have this awesome high school ministry going on. Yes, sir. Then how do you pivot to Captain Rex, which is politely to say not a high school ministry? It's actually a long story, but I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. All right. Um, the ministry was so successful that we had to purchase downtown buildings and create a youth center. Well, um, to fund the ministry, cause we were open all the time, given, 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 um, I went into business. Um, I took the principles that I used in the ministry and used them in business. And so now I, we were had eight six, very successful businesses and it was also to help the ministry grow. So I purchased the downtown movie theater and I opened up a school of fine arts to teach little kids theater. Cause I still like theater and I like directing. So I opened the school of fine arts. Um, we're in business and our businesses are flourishing. So now we've got, you know, I own half of the downtown and um, everything's flourishing and going great. And um, my dad, I, I looked at my dad's church and I saw that his vision wasn't being um, accomplished. And so I was like, dad, I want to help you accomplish your vision for the church. Mm -hmm. So I went on staff as executive administrative pastor uh, for my dad because I thought, you know, I'm almost 30 years old now. Season I probably veteran. need to move up to the big church. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Uh, so I went on staff, and within six months, the church helping put to words the vision my dad had, helping communicate his heart, because, I mean, he had a great vision, um, and getting it on path, the church doubled. Wow. Within six months, over doubled, and we went into a half a million dollar building project, built a child care center. Um, it was amazing. About all this time, um, in the middle of running eight businesses and being part of two very successful ministries and all of this, uh, of course, my wife, um, I'm just a mascot. I'm the visionarian. Like, this is how you do it, but I'm not the executor. I can show you how it's done maybe at first, but I'm not the one who's going to do all the work day in, day out. I'm the one with the crazy idea, and I know how to get it done, and I'll do it at first to show you how to do it, but I, I get bored because I'm doing... <laughs> <laughs> no way. What are you eight, talking about? Eight unless businesses, I'm two ministries, uh, three unless churches. Unless I'm uncomfortable, I'm not yeah. comfortable. Okay. I, I like yeah. being pushed. Rubber bands are only effective if they're stretched. Stretch me. I like to be pushed to the limits. My wife's the one who does the, the consistent work and handling all of that. 
and um, and stress. You know, being where I was a workaholic. It, it, I, just to put a like, where in that process did you get married? Because <laughs> I got married uh, July of two thousand, right after I started the youth ministry. Right after I got the job at the school district. Okay. Okay. Cool. I was because I'm like, oh, where did you have time to get yeah, married? No, I, I got the job early July, and then I got married late July because my father-in-law told me, if you want to wear marry my my daughter, you got to have a real job because you know oh. doing youth ministry wasn't a real job, <laughs> just porter. So uh, that's when I got the job with the school district. Okay. 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 So that's that's. Continue. So, I'm sorry. So now sorry. here we are. Connecting all the dots. The end of 2008. Okay. And uh, and then we get into, so, into 2000. In eight years, you've created eight businesses, two successful ministries, and now a new church with a new a new building, a new church, and everything else for your dad? Uh, yeah, a child care center, yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I know. He's man on fire. Uh, <laughs> yeah. right. so, Save some for the rest well, of us. Well, well, <laughs> no, this is where it gets interesting. Um, it was a big series of events and this is where it actually is a very long story and very detailed, but through some of it, you know, LaDonna, my wife's uh, mom passed away at an early age from breast cancer. Uh, 42 is when she was diagnosed and the doctors found a lump in, uh, in my wife's, you know, the same thing her mom died from. And, I made a decision right then that no amount of money is worth your life. What good is it to gain the whole world and yet lose your own family, you know, the whole thing. And so uh, we decided to uh, walk away from it all. Uh, literally walk away from it all. Um, give what we could give away. Um we lost what we had to lose. And, you know, we made, and in the process, I made some bad decisions. Uh, a lot of people, my friends would tell me, you got the Midas touch. Everything you touch turns to gold. Uh, it's successful. But in this process of all of that, I made some bad decisions and, um, and lost some stuff and had hurt. And, uh, you know, got out of ministry completely. Oh. And I said, well, you know what? That's when I, I felt, you know, I've always dreamed that I was going to be a world changer, not just change my community in the, the high school, but actually make an impact in this world, help the world somehow. Um, oh, I know how you could do that. Movies. And so I had an idea of a really great movie, but I didn't know anything about the movie business because I was in live theater and I was a director and uh, a roommate of mine um, from college I hadn't talked to in eight years was a director for a music video. And so he called and said, hey, you want to play the part in this uh, music video? The Good Lord Loves You is a country, Christian country music video. I was like, yeah. And I did that. And man, I got that bug, that spark. Because I hadn't acted myself in... 10 years. I was a director. I directed and I taught kids. And so I got that spark of acting. I was like, wow, this is fun. So I'm going to become a professional actor. And here I am going out and I'm going to be a professional actor. And God's blessing was still on my life because they say it takes seven years to break into the business to get your first movie role. In my first year, I did seven movies. Wow. And so um, <laughs> God bless. And, um, but I was out of ministry. The only ministry I was doing was Chariots of Light. And Which that's the biker, the biker club that's yeah. associated with Jerry Civil Ministries. But it wasn't the outreaches, it was just the fun time. We're going, yeah, yeah all right. Ride. Yeah. But I'm part of ministry because I'm part of Chariots of Light. It was August 2000. No, the end of July, 2012. So now we're in 2012. Mm -hmm. For three years, I'm not involved in ministry. For three years, eh, I'm not doing anything at all. Mm -hmm. And I now I'm like 35 years old. It's too late for me. 
I missed my opportunity. I was on fire. I mean, you, like you said, all that success. By the time I was 30 years old, I mean, uh, all, you know, yes. it, yeah, but now nothing. Um, we were millionaires before we were 30 years old, but now we're half a million dollars in debt. You know, it's thousandaires. Right. Yeah, and <laughs> not making an influence, not preaching, not in ministry, and everything else, and it's too late. It's too over. It's over. So what? What was the switch for you? What turned it back on? I took my kids to a, a Christian kids camp, and they were young, so it was, it was kids camp, and um, I had some sound equipment left because one of my businesses was I had sound uh, sound equipment. I provide mm -hmm. sound equipment for concerts and stuff. I still had some of that left. And so the church, the, the camp asked me to run their sound for them. So I'm sitting in the back in the sound booth and the kids ministry is puppets like, Hey kids, Jesus loves you. Really? It, puppets done well or cool. Right. These were done bad. <laughs> really bad. My seven year old son is seven about to turn eight. Turns around and looks at me. I'm back in the sound booth. He gives me that look. Really, Dad? Really? <laughs> this is, it was that bad. What it was, is this? And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, this is so bad. You know, what happened to the gospel bills that I grew up? Right. Uh, what happened to the Bible mans and, you know, quality, good kids ministry? And these are the thoughts that's just going in my mind. And uh, the next day at the camp, there was this, and this is the, click kind of started happening uh this old farmer he used to knew i was in the ministry and used to know the success that our youth ministry had and he says hey how are you doing how's the ministry going and i'm like mm, i'm not in ministry anymore i haven't been in ministry for three years <laughs> you know and he's like really he was shocked why and i was like well because being in the kind of ministry that we were in with teenagers that nobody wants, you always hear the bad stuff. They never tell you the good stuff. It was always, I mean, we were always, it was rough stuff. Um, kids that were homeless, kids that were in abusive, I mean, situations. I mean, there's reasons why the kids are the way they're at most of the time. And right. it's, and so, I mean, it was bad. And so you're dealing with all this stuff. It, it, it you know, it's hard on you emotionally and everything. And so, anyways, I, I told him the old adage. Here's the reason why I'm not in ministry. You know, you know the old saying, you can lead a horse to water. Can't but you can't make him drink. But yeah. you can't make him drink. That old farmer looked me right in the eye. He said, then you ain't a good farmer. I said, what are you talking about, old man? <laughs> Man, I grew up in ah. South Texas. Man, do you see I got boots on? Because I was, you know, I just filmed some westerns and stuff. So, I mean, I was all cowboy. I, what are you talking about? I'm not a good farmer. He said, I can lead my horse to water and I can make him drink. I said, how do you do that? He said, I put a salt block next to that horse trough. And when that horse licks that salt, he can't help but to drink. And I got a Holy Spirit revelation at that moment. It was like a light bulb. Ha ha. You know, it was like one of those, one of those moments. I can yeah. hear the choir singing, ah, you know, whatever. No, that, <laughs> like, <laughs> like <laughs> lightning coming, yeah. light coming yeah. from this guy. But no, it was, it was, uh, it was my goosebump. My goosebumps got pregnant, man. It was like, whoa, I could feel it. You are the salt of the earth. If you're salt, because what good is salt? It's lost its flavor. It's henceforth mm -hmm. good for nothing to be tossed out and trodden underfoot of man. And I felt like people were trying, walking on me. But if you're real salt, when people get around you, they can't help but to drink from the river that never runs dry. They can't help but to drink from the fountain of life. And I and I realize it's not the horse's fault, it's the farmer's fault. So I had to start doing some changing in me of how to be better salt. Mm -hmm. The next day, I'm loading my kids up from camp, and I'm headed home. And I get a call from Bill Horn saying, hey, brother, I need you in uh, Sturgis. And I'm like, yeah, we're going to ride, you know, Chariots of Light, motorcycle ministry. Right. But it was just, you, you'd go from church to church and listen to Dr. Savelle preach. You know, that was my, that's my ministry. Yeah, fill me up, brother. Yeah, this is great. Um, he said, no, no, we're doing street evangelism, one-on-one -on -one evangelism. And this is what I said. Uh, yeah, no, I don't do that. 
He goes, what do you mean you don't do that? I said, I'm not called for that. He said, brother, we're all called for that. Out of obedience to my leader, I said, okay, I'll be there in two days. Give me two days. Um, and I started having a, you know what, before I get my, before I find out and fulfill my mission, my passion, my purpose, I got to fulfill my first calling. And that's to win souls. So I told my wife, oh, all right, we're going to Sturgis on the bike. And so we loaded up the bike and started heading to Sturgis. No radio, no chatting. And I'm nervous as all get out because I got to talk to people one-on-one. I can act on top of a stage, but one-on-one ministry, I was intimidated, like scared, sweating bullets. And so I just started praying in the spirit all the way up there and in my head and my thinking of what well, right. kids ministry. This was three days later. I mean, you know, all, all stirring of this, on the inside all, of you. and mm-hmm. all, it was like God downloaded Captain Rex in me. Every hundred miles we stopped to fill up with fuel. I'd pull out my phone and just start talking everything that I got. I mean, I got the theme song, the whole, the whole, everything. I mean, the map is the Bible, the Holy Spirit, your compass, the words of treasure. I mean, I got it all. Wow. And I'm so excited. I'm so excited. And I, we go to Sturgis. Of course, we tell people, I win people to Jesus. I get over my fear of talking to people one-on-one. And, uh, I, but I told Bill, I said, I got to be back in a week. Because my mom my wife, for my birthday, she had bought me my uh, captain's license for me to go on a sailboat in the Gulf of Mexico to get my captain's license. A, a passion I've always had. Because mm-hmm. um, I, I like sailing and stuff. So the next week, I'm in the Gulf of Mexico getting my captain's license while I meet a filmmaker because it was an idea for a TV show, not the live adventure. Uh, A week after that, I'm on Lake Travis filming a Kickstarter video for this Captain Rex's Treasure Adventure TV show, Kids Saturday Morning TV show. Uh, Two weeks after that, enough money comes in for the first 10 episodes. So every weekend, we're on the Corpus Christi filming the TV show. Mm -hmm. Um, now we're in fast forward to about April of 2013. We're editing it. So I'm watching, I'm letting my brother's kids watch the show. I'm letting my uh, boss's kids watch the show to see what they think. And my boss is like, man, that's all my kids want to watch is that five minute clip you gave me. They just want to watch it over and over. And it's with coconut, of course, the parrot. They think that's the funniest I mean, she's thing. It's pretty catchy. It's like, you're, you're on to something. So I'm like, yes, this is going to be a big TV hit. I didn't realize Christian television, you got to pay to be on. Yeah. You don't get paid. Same. Yeah. <laughs> All the Christian televisions wanted me. Yeah. <laughs> Every one of them wanted me to pay him. Yeah. yeah. And so um, I was like, okay. Um, and then my brother's like, this is my kids love it. In fact, they're calling you Captain Rex instead of Uncle Rex. Uh, he goes, hey, you think you can come do it as a vacation Bible school? For our church, we have like a $300 budget. And I'm like, uh, it's a TV show. We have different locations. We're on a pirate ship and then we're on the beach. No, I can't do it. I said, well, let me think about it. So I'm looking at the script and I'm like, you know what? I can make this work. It's like we're going on these different places, but I need a set. So I pull out a piece of paper and I draw up this stage set that can come apart. And the stage set that you've seen on the stage. Yep. That same one? Same one. I draw it up and I realize this is it. Everything I've ever done in my life culminated into this. I mean, from teaching kids to everything. I mean, literally everything. And so I wrote my letter of resignation because uh, for the last three years, me and my wife had been working really hard to get us out of debt from walking away from everything. Mm-hmm. And I knew that at the end of that month, I was, cause we took one salary to apply to our debt and then we lived off of one salary. And uh, we've always just lived off of one salary, whether it went to ministry or, but right. this, it, this way it was to go to the, our debt. And I knew I could, at the end of this month, we're debt free. So we don't need my salary anyway. So I typed my letter of resignation and I sent it in without telling my wife. I get home, Uh-oh. <laughs> I get home and I'm like, babe, guess what I did today? And I'm telling you, this is where it's so important that you are, you and your spouse are like one and you both got your backs no matter what. 
And uh, I have a really great wife because I told my wife, I was like, uh, I turned in my list of resignation today. She says, what'd you do that for? I was like, well, this Captain Rex thing. And she said this, she goes, do you believe it's God's plan? I said, babe, yes, yes, yes. I know it's God's plan. And she said, well, then I guess I need to turn in my letter of resignation also. Now I'm like, whoa, Nelly, <laughs> wait a minute. We still need a salary to live off of. Oh, wait a minute. But Captain Rex, when when I was filming the movies like the Green Lantern, I was in New Orleans for a month. I was with I was I wasn't around my family and it tore me up inside. We're a big family oriented. So when I wrote Captain Rex, I made sure all four of us was in this TV show. And so Captain Rex was my family. It, uh, it's right. me and my family. I mean, every one of them was as important as I was. And so she goes, well, she goes, I'm turning my letter of resignation too. And I'm like, wait a minute, we need to think about this. And she goes, do you believe it's God's plan? I said, babe, I know it's God's plan. She said, well, then there's no plan B. Kill the ox, burn the plow. Mm-hmm. Come on. Not something to go back to. Right. And I'm like, Okay. So the next day she turned in her letter of resignation and I loaded up my two kids in a van that I spray painted. We called it the gypsy wagon, um, had a little camper conversion, no shower in it. We're homeless, don't own nothing, but don't owe anything. But it's like we're starting all over uh, June of 2013 with one booking, one booking. And that was with a $300 budget, but we were living by faith and happier than we had ever been and that was uh 2013 and since then we've ministered to over a million people live led over i don't know 130,000 i don't have the exact numbers in front of me um in the salvation prayer one-on-one that doesn't include tv and internet and everything you know it's pretty impressive the way god took all of the things that you laid down and then he brought and built such an incredible thing underneath you. And what I hear in this beginning part of your story, uh, you know, your friend said that you have the Midas touch, but what I hear is obedience. Yes. I hear God said, do this. Okay, we're doing it 100%, 150%, <laughs> 200%, and then it's blessed. Will you shine some light on to what, what is it that that drives that level of, of obedience and trust in you? You and LaDonna, really, you both do the, the it, same thing. Yeah, it, it, no, no, that is the key. People ask yeah. why. It, that it is, is not key. me. To go from four to 150, the only way is, is it's God. And the only thing I can take credit for is I'm obedient. That's it. And that's why I preach Gideon so much. Okay. Gideon, think about it. God told him to get down to 300 people. Tell all these 9,700 that didn't cup their hands to go home. That's hard. That's hard to do that. Uh, where I know I'm going to be only left with 300, and he did. To split up, split up. We need to stick together. S- you know, blow the trumpet. Do, 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 do. Here I am. Oh, you can't see me? Psh, here I am. Oh, here, let me march closer. You know, opposite of what you'd think. But uh, that's why I preach it so much. But Gideon was obedient. And because of that, uh, he was given the victory, and God got all the glory. And so uh, I just want to. God to get the glory, you know, and that's why I want to be obedient and do whatever he says. So that way, uh, he fight my battles for me and then, and then he gets all the glory. Praise God. Did I, did that answer your question? Or what was the so. question? I what just was the question? Here, I'm just sitting here listening to all of the things. And of course there's ups and downs in everybody's story, right? We all, we all make some okay, mistakes now, sometimes. Now, and 2000, it's, it, now, I ain't gonna lie. It was not easy. Loading up, I am 35 years old now. I mean, Jesus is dead by this age, you know. I should have been. Jesus is dead. I mean, uh, uh, come on. I'm, uh, you know, 35, and I'm, I think I may have missed it, but nothing, to, nothing in her name to show for. Homeless, with one booking and hitting the road. And it was, it could have been very easy to want to give up at the far start. Mm-hmm. You know, we only had three bookings, I think, that whole summer. What do you do those other days in between? You know what I did? I took my van to the beach 
And I had, I lived on the beach. <laughs> I had beachfront property. Well, also there's free showers at the beach because there was no shower in the thing. But you see, I, I, I always had, I changed my perspective and I always had that perspective like, this is awesome. This is, I mean, I could have got, went in that rabbit hole, that dark place down to depression where I'm a loser, I'm a failure, I'm homeless and my two kids. And, and I didn't, I, I kept the, the positivity of this is, this is fantastic. Look, I don't even have to pay taxes and I got beef front property, you know? You didn't mean that uncle Sam. Yeah. He paid all of his taxes. No, I mean, as far as living on the beach, I was living on the beach for free, you know? (laughs) And, uh, because of that, kids, they copy what they see. And since I had that, I chose, I didn't, I didn't have it. I chose to make myself have it until I did have it. I chose to be, this is awesome. This is fantastic. Because it was starting out by faith. I, by faith, this was great. Uh, even though I didn't feel like it was great, you know, but it was, it was great. And then eventually it did come great, but because I always had that mentality, my kids thought it was great. It, 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 now it was difficult at first. Uh, my daughter, I mean, she just turned 12 years old. Uh, I would have to leave her friends to load up in this old van to sleep in a chair or a, a little loft bed thing with her you know, nine-year-old brother in the same van with my parents and the van didn't even, the generator went out, so it didn't have air conditioning when driving down the road. Um, It was hot summertime in Texas. You know, it would have been real easy. And I mean, and yeah, she complained a little bit, uh, (laughs) you know, starting out, it's hot. I mean, but it wasn't. for it right now. I'm like, oh, uh, dad. No, but it wasn't, but. It was funny how it's hot turned into because I had that, that positivity. That, yeah, that that look, that outlook, that um, I knew this was coming up, and I called my kids, uh, called my son yesterday afternoon and my daughter last night, and I asked them. I said, "Do you regret anything? What was bad about it?" starting out was it hard was it difficult uh tell me some of the and my son was literally no dad it was great i was like yeah but what were some of the challenges he goes dad we didn't have any challenges it was like really cool it was great i mean we lived in a tour bus and got to go all over and i'm i'm like i said i because I, I i'm trying to remember some of the difficult things with you guys and the only thing i could remember was there was one starting out that first christmas we had only had like four bookings the whole year and that's just barely enough to put gas in the tank and i set my kids down and i said uh for christmas this year we're not um you're only going to get probably one present and it's going to be a a small present because this is i i wanted to give them a heads up let him know. And I remember seeing a little tear come down my, my son's eye. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, buddy. He said, it's okay, dad. I said, you know why we're doing this? He goes, yep. We're, <laughs> I'm sorry, I get teared up. Um, he said, we're changing other kids' lives. He said, it's worth it. And um, so I wrote a Christmas show because of that. And there's a church called, and uh, they asked, hey, we heard you writing a Christmas show. Come do it for us. And I'm like, okay, yeah. And I did it, and they gave the ministry a check, and then they gave us a check personally for $2,000. And that was my kid's Christmas. I was like, see, you give to God, and he'll always give it right back. And um, so, I mean, that was the only thing I remember that was kind of difficult and my son didn't, I mean, he goes, oh, yeah, I remember that. It was a great Christmas. I was like, yeah, it was. It was a great Christmas. And so, because he, he's like me, it's all sunshine and rainbows. And so I was like, well, I better call my daughter. And so, because uh, my daughter, she uh, she's uh, she's more, keeps the books. And she was a little bit older. I mean, she's 12 years old and had to leave her friends and all of that stuff. And um, and so I called her and 
And man, I mean, they loved, they loved, I guess you'd call it performing, mm-hmm. ministering. They loved it. I mean, um, I think there was one time my son didn't get to do a show and we were doing 220 shows a year. Um, and there was one time my daughter didn't get to do a show because they needed an attitude adjustment and you're not going to get on stage and minister, uh, like acting that way. <laughs> and so they wanted to be on stage and minister. And, um, and, and there was only like one thing that my daughter, uh, thought that there was, you know, issues with and it was problems. And it was when we brought on interns, um, mm-hmm. and to pour into them and, uh, and cause my daughter liked being just us four and, and um, just us four ministering as a family, as that tight knit group. It really sounds like your family is kind of the epicenter of everything that you do in ministry and it flows out of. And thinking back on all of those years on the road, um, going from show to show to church to church, um, what was it? that you love the most about pouring into your kids that way. I mean, that's an intimate family setting. Yeah. You guys are, well, are yeah, together we live, all we of live, the time, yeah, right? 24 seven homeschool. Um, it's looking now years later, obedience, what we talked about right. Gideon, what we talked about. My kids always knew. And I learned this from my dad. My dad, uh, he was a pastor, right. but he, he practiced what he preached. And I took on the mentality, I'm going to preach what I practice. That means I'm going to live it. We're going to do it way before we ever preach it. My son last year was going to school um, at a school, one of the A&Ms. I won't say which one it was. It's actually the one me and my wife went to and um, in South Texas. And he, to play football, of course, first year, red-shirted. And uh, this year, he would have been starting running back. He would have scholarship. They paid for it and everything. And he said, Dad, I've got to get out of here. Why? Because uh, it, it would not make sense why you would want to leave a place who you would get to start and all that. He goes, it's toxic. He knew something wasn't right. It was toxic. And... I said, come on, give me an example. Um, over when we were on the Amazon River over Thanksgiving, LaDonna's dad um, passed away. Right. He went into surgery. It was supposed to be a simple surgery, and he didn't come out. He, uh, my son called the coach and said, hey, my grandpa just passed away, and I need to go home. And the coach literally told him, that's fine as long as you're at be back by practice Monday. And he said, dad, I got to get out of here. And he wanted to go to another A&M, which is a division one up here in North Texas. And, uh, it was going to cost him $11,000 a semester. He would lose a year of eligibility. He had to sit out this year. That means he, he's not even going to get to play football. He has to sit out, lose a year of eligibility, but, even though, just like Gideon, no matter how crazy it sounds, you got to do what you feel God tells you to do. And he said, this is where I'm supposed to go, Dad. I'm supposed to do this. And I said, oh, okay. I didn't want him to. I wanted him to stay and play football at least one year, then transfer next year. Especially, they're going to pay for it. Hey, let them pay. You know what I mean? That right. doesn't make sense to me. Well, um, a little over a month ago, my dad passed away. His other grandpa called his coach and said, my grandpa just passed away. Um, I'm going to have to miss practice. And this coach, he had the whole team kneel down, lay hands on my son and pray for him. That right there um, is worth 22 grand, you know, to pay for that. You see, Looking back on that, knowing that um, my kids um, not just did a show, but actually um, did what we taught and is able to hear the Holy Spirit and and listen and obey. And um, even though when it don't make sense and um, 
you know, I'm believing great things for him. Yeah. So that, that is what, um, yeah, I hope that answered your That's question. That's what the years on the road, yeah, the intimate setting, having yeah. your family be the center of what you do in ministry produces children who hear from God yes. and move forward with what they hear, whether it's crazy or not. They watched you do all kinds of crazy things right. because <laughs> you knew that the Lord told you to do it. And it produced in their lives. They watched it happen. And that's a testimony to, to. Oh, then my daughter. Oh man, yeah. my daughter, the big excellence thing. She won't even let me slip on. Hey, let's take a shortcut on this while I camp. No dad, that's not excellent. We're going to do it. So you got to, you know what I mean? She's, she pushes that. If it's not excellent, then no, we're not doing it. You've got to go for excellence. So, <laughs> yeah, but both of the kids say, and it don't mean they're perfect now. I mean, yeah, there's different things that I wish they wouldn't do. Maybe like post all your drama on social media. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying which one of my kids do that. We're going to bring that up. you all that's friends with my kids. With <laughs> you can follow them. Ads. Sorry, love you yeah. kids. Love well, you kids. But, you know, there's certain things. I mean, it's not like it's bad, bad things. Sure. But uh, ew, uh, those bar. that heard my stories know that... Uh, uh, for when it comes to, I don't indulge people with my, like we were on the road. We had 18 people on the road. One of our rigs dropped an axle, the short shaft on the road. And I didn't let any of my staff tell their family, their right. friends, post on anything on Facebook at all. I said, look, we're not giving in the enemy any credit at all. I said, when we get the victory and we will get the victory, then you could post on Facebook. I mean, that's just the way I am with social media. Right. When my son was in that accident, I didn't let nobody. Right. I don't need anybody feeling sorry for me. I needed my son healed or I need my rig fixed or right. whatever. That's just the way I am. So, you know, there's some things that maybe I, I would, but still, but for the most part though, they, you know. Yeah. You produce two straight arrows and that's something to praise both God love about. God, yeah. So, yeah. Both love God, serving God, doing great. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it goes back to your original skill set, not skill set, but people know integrity. Like people know authenticity. And the only way to get 150 high school kids to buy into anything is authenticity. You know, like like truly seeing it being walked out. Because I know I'm one of those people. If I see a fraud, I'm not saying my discernment skill is my, my gifting, but I always tell when someone's not who they are. And, and it's so deflating. And it's so uninspiring and it's so just, it just may, it, it can, it can shipwreck a, a, a walk real fast. If you see someone who's supposed to be in a leadership, who's supposed to be doing these things and who's on stage saying it, and you said it really great is that you preach what you practice. And that's something that I think more people should probably adapt and adopt and take on because it's so easy to get on stage for an hour, two hours and, and fake it. Or I say the words cause you speak Christianese or whatever, but the other six and a half days, that's the hard stuff. Yes, sir. That's the meat of it. Yes, sir. You know, and so clearly your your kids got to see someone walk it. And so it's a lot easier to, to, to walk it yourself when you've had, you know, that kind of experience growing up, which is like just amazing. Well, not just even the kids or some of our interns. I mean, the young adults. I mean, we lived all together on a tour bus. I mean, they were with me 24-7. And if I, you can't fake it for that long. No, yeah, you can. <laughs> I mean, you can put a you chandelier I mean? on a house. And, and, and that all long, those yeah. guys are still, right. and girls are still loving God. And whenever I call them, they'd be the first one to come to do ministry like Marta. I mean, she still right. comes up to Crowley when we do she shows does. here and stuff. And and so I believe that does show the integrity. Um, our core values is the same as heritage of faith, timeliness, integrity integrity is big you got to do what you say do say yeah. what you do excellence you know i'm gonna it's not perfection it's excellent i'm gonna be better today than i was yesterday right and then smiles you know hey it's the goodness of god that brings people to repentance and so you know we'll do the whole thing smiles so thank you perfect well now that you're here at heritage and we love that you're here obviously our motto that we are we are blessed to have is making winners in life and just we're always curious as to what does that mean to you to not be a sundial in the shade. What good is a sundial in the shade? Hmm. I want to be a sundial in the sun, fulfilling the purpose of 
that sundial, which is to tell time using the sun. So to make be a winner, in my opinion, um, being a winner in life is to fulfill the purpose and the call that God has given you. He's given each and every one of us abilities. And that's why I was just obedient to take the abilities that he's given me to share the love of Jesus. He's given every single person abilities and to take that ability and to be able to show the love of Jesus and fulfill the purpose and calling that he has for you. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're good plans, plans to give you hope in the future. So if you're able to fulfill that plan that God has for you, man, I think you're a winner, right? That to me, that would be my definition is using the abilities he's given us to fulfill the purpose he's called us for. So that way we can run the race he wants us to run and win that race. Well, you, your life has for sure demonstrated that all the way through. And we're really excited for where you're going in the future. And I wish we had like another whole hour to talk more yeah, about I, it. Yeah, I don't think really scratch the surface really? so many things that we want to talk about that I don't even think. I, it's, I'm sorry. I told no, no, y'all I'd talk a no, lot. No, no, I'm don't sorry. Like, what, like the stuff you talked about, I was like, I didn't even know. I like to tell I, stories. I didn't even know to ask the stuff that you were talking about. So I'm, I'm so happy. So will you, will you promise us the next time that you're in, Crowley, Texas, yes. that we can set up another opportunity to go just yes. a, a bit deeper. But this, I enjoyed it so much. It mm -hmm. was so good. I mean, a person who loves God and is willing to be obedient, no matter what the cost or how crazy it sounds, is is a winner. And that's why you've been so successful. It's just, I hear God and I obey. So we missed your wife too. You're going to have to bring her back next time. I too. miss her too, yeah. Well, that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us, church family. In the show notes, we'll have linked uh, the Captain Rex website so you can look at it and a few of our very favorite adventures when he's been here at Heritage. Um, so be sure to push play next Friday as we have another winning conversation. <laughs>